How to build a simple inventory management system. Hello, and welcome to today's course on how to build a simple inventory management system. I am John Palermo. For those of you who don't know me, I am a plus 20 year veteran of the high tech industry, starting with advanced electronics and naval nuclear power back in the 1980s, the dot com explosion of the 1990s, on through to today's world, in a variety of roles and operations. Pardon me while I go over my notes, but just to review, we're going to cover a standard inventory flow, the basic components of an inventory management system, the basic processes, considerations for physical layout, available resources, and by available resources I mean software tools, applications you can use for your inventory management system. In this case, what we're going to be doing is building a tool, or rather going over an example that was built ahead of time. I found through the years that the best way to teach a complex subject is actually to walk the students through building the application. After that, we will actually go through the building process. Thank you for joining me for this course. And again, the best of success to all of you and your teams. Looking forward to working with you. As any decent engineer or developer can tell you, before laying down the first piece of steel to build a ship or writing the first piece of code to a program, you need to know what the form and function of your process looks like. In this case, we're looking at a standard inventory flow. If you will stop the video and take a quick look at this flowchart, you'll notice there are a couple of items missing. As an example, right after procurement, you would normally have a vendor or suppliers and they're not on a chart. Additionally, you may notice that this is specifically for a hardware or pro hard product uh, type of flow versus a software licensing or software product flow. Also, what is not included on this chart are the distribution center and the processes that go with that, yard management systems, uh, anything with regard to foreign trade zones, CTPAT, a few other items. Now let's talk about the different colors as far as the different paths go. You'll notice that there are some lines that are green, some that are purple, blue, red, black. Well, let's start with the green ones. This is the primary flow of product, basically from sales to order fulfillment, shipping, straight to the customer. The purple lines that you see going in and out of the inventory management system are the data flow. The red lines are basically the defective product. If effectively, if something goes out to the customer, it breaks or it arrives broken. Customer contacts service. Service then uh, sends an order back. That's one of the green paths. To service order fulfillment or, in some cases, uh, warranty fulfillment. And they, in turn, pull inventory out of service inventory and send that to the customer. Now, when the customer sends back the broken materials, these go to a RMA product screening repair process. Now, the names for all of these functions will vary from company to company. This is normal. As an example, instead of RMA, you may have an RTV function if it's coming from a store. And there's a number of other names, but we're not going to go into that just yet. The point to this flowchart was to outline all the data points and the different types of information you can gain from your process. Basically, the red lines, as an example, would be the fallout rate, which would actually feed into your forecast. The green lines, of course, are your demand, and then the blue lines, of course, are also the demand for services. There's also a set of bl the black lines, which is basically what most people would call shrinkage. How much inventory you're losing, how often do you have to recycle your inventory. All of this can be turned into calculations that can work back into your inventory management system. Now, getting on with the inventory management system. When building an inventory management system, there are some physical assets that, of course, you're going to account for. The basic components are the incoming inventory or product itself, the stock location, the ID for the location, the product ID, the pick sheet, the pick container, believe it or not, the scanner or barcode or the mechanism by which you use to capture or transfer information, the material handler or the person who's actually processing all of this, and of course, reports and more reports. In addition to the physical assets, there are also some basic processes. Each of these you can uh, develop independently uh, as far as the coding and the rules and the logic go. Examples of your processes will be the receiving, stocking, picking, and of course the adjustment process, forecasting, and asset recovery. Keep in mind these processes will interact at the data table layer. 
Another aspect to an inventory management system is that you need to keep in mind, in addition to your processes, and which also affects how your processes work, is the physical layout. As an example, with regard to product grouping, you may have, say, firearms all in one group, and that may be broken out into uh, rifles and handguns. Another would be footwear, which you would have broken out by different types of vendors. It could also be separated by formal versus sporting sporting goods. There are several reasons for organizing your products by groupings on the inventory floor this way. The first off is stocking when you receive product. If you have all your materials from a single vendor in a single location, that means, a, that means one trip with a pallet to the stocking locations. It also means during the picking process that different types of logic, <coughs> such as uh, the picking path, or the way the product arrives at the store and is stocked can be applied. That covers product groupings for now. Moving on to location IDs, the point here is the way you set up the number structure, the way you set up the logic to your numbering on a location ID, determines how the queries that you write for either the letdown process or your picking process, and as an example, the Z path picking, will be affected. This, in turn, will impact your data table structure. Other considerations, as an example that I've mentioned before, are your primary versus secondary pick locations, or more commonly known as the forward versus uh, reserve pick faces. The idea here is that you may have over a million SKUs in your database or products that your company sells, but at any point in time, especially during uh, seasonal changes, you're only going to have a few thousand that are actually active. With that, you also need to keep in mind where your damaged materials are going to go and how you're going to separate those from your regular inventory, how you're going to separate returns, because as uh, some companies have found out the hard way, there are legal liabilities here, and the list of considerations goes on. As an example, security. I mentioned firearms earlier. You will need to have a restricted uh, space or lockdown access. There may be regulatory requirements, uh, as an example, hazmat, uh, with regard to hazardous materials. And there may be issues with like foreign trade zones. Uh, as an example with CTPAT, there are requirements as to where inventory is held and where it is not held, meaning accessibility to customs officers. Moving on, let's talk about available resources. I'll be discussing a build-it-yourself option uh, with Microsoft Access, but the, uh, there's also an alternative out there for low-budget or no-budget uh, operations where the package needs to be customized. An example of this would be OpenOffice Database, which I do highly recommend. You'll find it's a Visual Basic Applications a code, a code base. In the event you don't have time to actually build your uh, customized uh, inventory management system. Uh, there are also some free options I provided a link to earlier. Uh, you can go check these out. Uh, just as a word of warning though, those uh, tools will be uh, set up to the process that that particular company or that developer designed. And if you do have time, if you do have the budget, there's also see, uh, there's also commercial off-the-shelf options available. Getting back to the build-it-yourself option, We'll be using MS Access version 2000. The reason for this is because the interfaces are a bit easier to use than the uh, latest 2010-2007 uh, uh, version. As we get started, I'll remind you of those processes that we were discussing earlier. Here, we're going over the receiving process. Now, as we develop this application, or as I walk through the example I've already developed, I won't uh, walk through this particular t uh, part of the uh, tool. However, just for discussion, uh, the truck arrives, and when the truck arrives, this is the point where you would normally capture the seal number on the truck as part of, say, as in, uh, a CT pad examples or security, and that would go into the receiving table. Then uh, your personnel, your material handlers would unload the truck. At the time they're unloading the truck, there's a variety of information they would capture at this point, basically who the freight carrier is, the tracking numbers, manifest numbers, uh, key requisition numbers, if these were associated with uh, your uh, purchasing process. Country of origin, which is now a customs requirement, uh, ship from address, part numbers, UPCs, and your purchase order numbers. And all of this, again, would feed back into your procurement uh, system. At this point, the inventory would be staged for stocking. Now, the point I'm making again is look at notice the receiving table. When it comes to the stocking process, same thing as with the receiving process, notice the tables. Uh, 
Now between each of the tables you'll see a series of arrows that indicate uh, interaction. This interaction is a series of queries and programs. In the case of our example with MS Access, of course, these are uh, VBA. And once again, to drive the point home concerning the data tables, here's the picking process. You'll notice as the material handler grabs the pick sheet, they'll go through and they scan the UPC, update the quantity, scan the location, and then scan the uh, pick container. All of this is interacting with each of the tables, and the tables are all, of course, interacting with each other through the queries and the programs. Uh, just to clarify a little bit, I won't go through how to build a pick sheet and the pick container process just yet, uh, since this is going to be a fairly simple inventory management system. To reemphasize, the key point I'm trying to make here is that as you go through your processes, keep an eye on the data you're going to capture and how you're going to organize that data. Right here on this slide, I have an example of four different tables that have been broken out by the product table, which uh, makes updates and tracking easier in terms of inventory, or I should say just the type of inventory, a transaction table to capture every time somebody brings something in or takes something out, a vendor table where you can track your vendors, and then of course your stock table or your inventory table. Pulling up our live example, here's uh, what our SKU reference table looks like. Here's a data view of our table, followed by the design view. Some of these elements should look familiar. As I'm opening up a few more of these examples and, of course, closing them down, uh, one thing to notice is how easy it, w it is to actually create a table and access. All you have to do is click on New, add your table elements, and then hit Save. Once you have your tables built, the next thing that we're going to move on to is the user interfaces, the forms, and your reports, and what these need to look like. Although we won't be building one out, uh, Forms to keep in mind, or layouts to keep in mind, is how you organize your pick sheets, how your reports are structured, and with MS Access as an example, if you connect it to Outlook, you can actually send out automatic email alerts. Other considerations when designing forms are how people read, left to right, top to bottom, uh, the edges of the documents, uh, where they cut off, where they don't, as well as how clear the meaning of the title is. Similar considerations also apply to the user interfaces. Although in, in, instead of a single page that you're looking at or a sheet that's being read, uh, we're talking about ease of use, the simplicity of the design, the speed of the process, the reliability of the process, as well as the accuracy of the processing and how effective it, how effective it is. Uh, one thing about the way you design a user interface, this will drive uh, process compliance. And you do this by making the user interface, the way the user interface is used, not only simple, but intuitively obvious. Skipping past the uh, data requirements for the user interface for receiving, here we have an example of a fairly simple user interface, the stocking menu. Basically all you have is the uh, employee ID, the SKU, which is also uh, the UPC, although it doesn't say so there, and the location. The description is automatically pulled up by the system, and the quantity is pre-filled out as a 1, which can also be edited by the user. What will happen is the user comes in to the stocking menu, they scan the UPC, or the barcode on the product, and then as soon as they do that, the system goes out, searches, pulls up the description, and then, the, and then it provides a recommendation concerning the location. And then what will happen is the user will scan the location. Once they do that, they hit enter. If they're using a barcode scanner, this is all fairly automatic. It's got auto tab going on in it. Then that's what I mean by obvious and simple. Very quick, very effective, and to the point. The same principles apply to the picking menu. In this case, let's go back to the uh, picking flip process flowchart. What I want to show here is where the design decisions actually begin for the user interface. What the flowchart is showing us here, particularly the items uh, circled in red, is the sequence of events that are going to take place on the user form or the user interface. Basically, when the user comes in, after the user is logged in, they're going to scan the UPC, auto tab is going to take them to the quantity, and then they're going to either hit tab or update the quantity. Uh, if the quantity is one, they leave it alone. If they have to update it, they enter the actual amount. Then they hit tab, and the next thing that's going to happen is they scan the location, and it'll auto tab over to the container. Uh, if they have a barcoded container, they're going to scan the barcode on the container, and all of this will be auto filled out. This tells you what the layout's going to be and what the sequence of events will be. Now, to emphasize this point, here's our live example. Although there is a slight difference here, effectively, as shown in the flowchart, the user comes in, scans the UPC, 
the description gets filled out. And although the flowchart shows auto tab to quantity, uh, the assumption in this case is that the quantity is going to be one, so it auto tabs to location. And again, as shown on the flowchart, the user would uh, scan in the location and it would auto tab over to the container field. And again, the idea here is they scan the look, they scan the uh, container ID, and then p either pick the container to do the next pick, or scan the next UPC, or close container to go ahead and ship it out to the uh, to the business unit or to the store. The point again, as I was mentioning, is that is this is how or where your initial design begins is in the flowchart and how it maps back to the actual user interface. Speaking of user interfaces, I've also taken the liberty of adding two subforms, one for pick status and one for inventory status. Uh, what this is intended to do is basically inform the user of how the pick is proceeding and what uh, is happening to the inventory. The it's not intended for the user to actually update these uh, particular subforms. It's information only which probably violates the keep it really simple rule. And last but not least, of course, are the uh, uh, planner menus. What you uh, see here is basically uh, an alert. To it's part of an alert process that comes up every time somebody scans in a UPC that's not in a database, which gives them an opportunity to put it in there for the first time. And they'll put in the uh, you know, vendor information, the UPC number description. And then I have another process, a series of processes that are built out for the planner, where the planner comes in and sets the levels. And by levels, I mean the basic stock level, uh, about what it, it's supposed to look like, and then what the minimum is to kick off a reorder, and then what the maximum is to actually uh, sell off excess inventory. Uh, that's about it on this topic. The next item is uh, query logic. Now we've talked a bit about picking and stocking and how these things work. Uh, one thing to be aware of is when you're building uh, queries uh, to actually populate forms or pull data from tables, it's going to vary from uh, use case to use case. As an example, if you're running a simple report for on-hand inventory, that'll come strictly from the uh, stock, stock table. Uh, if you're trying to do things like show forecasts, it's going to be a combination of your transaction history plus uh, your inventory that's on hand. And that can get fairly complex fairly quick. One of the things about it is that when you're building these queries, you can end up as many as three layers, uh, three layers deep on these queries. With that, you also have situations where none of the data tables by themselves are going to be adequate. The data actually needs to be combined. Uh, so you'll have to create a make table queries, delete table queries, and the reason for this for this is to speed up the process. An example of speeding up the process would be, uh, remember when I was talking about a million SKUs earlier and only a few thousand are actually active? What you would normally, what you would normally do is take a make table query and use a step down process where you're going from a million down to 500,000 down to a few thousand and then you're using the few thousand to drive your pick process. With that we come to the last part of an inventory management system, uh, training. As we have shown, if you design the application correctly and you make it uh, simple and easy to use and intuitively obvious, you minimize the training requirements for the application. Uh, in particular, our best examples were stocking and picking. And for more complex uh, operations, uh, there are a number of ways to minimize the complexity. Uh, one good example is the use of alerts where instead of requiring folks to go in and analyze the data, you automatically send them notices that they need to execute particular activities. With that, thank you very much for your time. And again, the best of luck and success to you and your teams, and I look forward to working with you. Have a great day.